Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about Newton's laws of motion and gravity. So let's go ahead and get started. And what we're going to start talking about are forces. Now, what is a force? Well, we can think of it as a push or pull. But in physics, it would be a quantity this is also a vector quantity, meaning that it has a magnitude, how strong the force is, and a direction. So we can see here in the diagram that there is F1 is pointing to the right with some strength and F2 is pointing upward with some strength. So those are two different forces. They have different magnitudes and different directions. And we often use these in a what we call a free body diagram. So instead of drawing the whole diagram we see here, we can simplify it to what's shown on the right. So you have the object in question as a dot at the center. And then F2 is pushing it upwards. F1 is pushing to the right. And you could add those forces together as a vector to get a total force and a, in what direction that happens to be acting. Now let's go ahead and look at Newton's laws of motion and what we see uh, Newton's first law of motion states that a body at rest remains at rest or if in motion remains in motion at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a net external force. So this is contrary to our everyday experience. What we typically see is that objects slow down. If we try to slide a book across the table, it's going to come to a stop. The reason it does not continue in a state of constant velocity is because of friction in that case. So friction or things like air resistance can slow down an object. Those can be the external forces acting. So one of the other things we could look at an example is an air hockey table. An air hockey table uses a jet of air to keep the puck from touching the surface and keep it moving very uh, easily. So if you slide a puck across an air hockey table, it pretty much is going the same speed at the other side as it was when it started. And that's because of Newton's first law of motion. Something will stay in motion or at a constant speed or will stay at rest if it is at rest. It's considered a universal law and applies to everything and everywhere in the universe. So the same kind of things would happen, for example, on the moon we did the experiment, we would get the exact same results. Now, what that also means is that any change in velocity. So this and remember, velocity is a vector, so it has a speed and a direction. So velocity could have a speed of some amount, a magnitude and a direction. If either of these is changing, that requires an external force. So we can think of that as the moon orbiting around Earth or Earth orbiting around our sun. Both of those are even though the velocity the speed stays roughly the same. The direction is constantly changing. Therefore, the velocity is changing. And they must be having a force act upon them that we'll look at later as gravity. Now, in terms of one of the other things we want to look at and we're thinking about mass mass is a different than weight so these are two very different uh, items the mass is the amount of matter within an object whereas the weight is the gravitational force pulling on it so between th those two they are quite different the mass in an object does not change so anywhere you can go anywhere in the universe, your mass will change. If you d go anywhere else in the universe, your weight would change. So if you go to the moon, the amount of matter in you hasn't changed. But because the gravitational force on the moon is less, you will weigh less by about a factor of six on the moon. If you were to stand on a scale on the moon, you would weigh a lot less than you do on Earth. Now, the other thing that we talk about with Newton's first law of motion is the concept of inertia. And that is the tendency of an object to try to either remain at rest or in motion. And you also get this everyday experience in, for example, a car. If you're driving down the road and have to slam on your brakes suddenly, you lunge forward. 
the car stopped but you were in motion and you wanted to continue at in that state of constant motion so you do that until some external force such as your seat belt pulls you backward and stops you but you will feel that lunge forward um, when when you suddenly stop also if you suddenly start so if, for example a roller coaster that launches you forward you will feel pushed back into the seat and that is again you were at rest and now you're trying to it's trying to accelerate you so you wanted to remain at rest so we look at that we wanted to look again at come back to mass and weight in my last point here which was what has more mass a kilogram of cotton balls or a kilogram of gold and in reality these two are equal they would have exactly the same amount of mass because there's the same amount of material in each one the amount of mass is the kilogram so even though the kilogram of cotton balls might seem fluffier and you might think of it as lighter and less dense it still contains exactly the same amount of material now let's go ahead and move on and look at Newton's second law here Newton's second law relates to force its force to the change in motion so we have to be careful what we're looking at here is what are the external forces acting on the system which we actually have to define what our system is so if the system is the child in the wagon here being pushed then the people pushing on it would be providing an external force however there can be cases where you would look at various different systems and we'll look at that in one of our examples here the net force is what causes the change in motion so if forces balance and are equal and opposite then there is no change in motion so for example in the image down here you have a weight force pulling down you have what we call a normal force upward and those two are equal and opposite so the wagon is not going to move in the vertical direction and of course that's what we expect the ground it the ground is pushing on it and it is pushing on the ground so there is no net force in the vertical direction however there may be a net force and in this case there is in the horizontal direction the force with which the adult is pushing is le is larger than the smaller force of friction which is pushing backwards so we can use our free body diagrams to be able to do this we can write out all of the forces that we see and in this case you'd write these forces for gravity and the normal force that are equal and opposite so they cancel and you'd have a larger force for the adult pushing and a smaller force for the frictional force going backward now what does Newton's second law of motion tell us well it tells us that two things first of all a larger force will give a larger change of motion so that change in motion is our acceleration so the acceleration is proportional to the force the more force with which you push the faster something is going to move and accelerate uh, so if you have one person pushing on the child's cart with some force you're going to have a certain amount of motion if you have two people it's going to be able to move even faster they're going to be able to apply more force we also know that a larger mass will have a smaller change in motion. So the more mass you have, the harder it's going to be to get that moving. So if you put a small child in the wagon, it's going to be a lot easier to move than it is a larger child. So the larger ch child will be harder to move. And if we put these together here, then we get Newton's second law which says that acceleration is equal to the net force divided by mass or as it's sometimes known the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration so F equals MA is the general general statement of Newton's second law but this is what it means it means that a larger force will give you a larger acceleration and a larger mass will have a smaller acceleration now what do we use for a unit for the force the unit for force is named after Sir Isaac Newton and that is the Newton and a Newton is the force needed to accelerate a one kilogram object at one meter per second squared 
So 1 Newton is equal to 1 kilogram meter per second squared as the unit of force. So our force units, if you have Newtons, if we have to break things down when you're balancing units, 1 Newton is a kilogram times meter per second squared. Now let's look at how this works and we looked a little bit with weight. Let's look at it in a little more detail. The net force on a falling object is the gravitational force. And if you remember from a previous lecture, the acceleration due to gravity is given by G or 9.8 meters per second squared. And we can also rewrite that as weight equals M times G. If you remember, this is the same as the acceleration and we had F equals ma as Newton's second law. Well, a is just given by g here. So this becomes g. The m stays the same. And the force is then the weight of the object. So the weight of an object is given by its mass times the gravitational constant, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. So the weight is the force with which the Earth or any other object pulls on an object. So if you have if you're standing on Earth, that would be your weight. We you get your mass in kilograms, multiply it by G. Uh, that would give you your weight in Newtons. So for a one kilogram object, we multiply that by 9.8 meters per second squared and get 9.8 Newtons for its weight. So we sometimes use kilograms as weight, but kilograms are actually mass. When you're actually measuring, you'd actually be measuring the Newton as the unit of, uh, of weight. Now, if we continue on and we look at a little more on gravity, and we're looking here at free fall. So we talk about weightlessness in space, how astronauts are weightless. Well, in reality, the gravitational force and the acceleration due to gravity are not that much different at the International Space Station than on Earth. In reality, the astronauts are in a constant state of free fall. So we can simulate free fall here on Earth. You can take an airplane up to a high uh, height and then bring it down in kind of a free fall. So for a short time, you can simulate weightlessness here. However, at the, on the space station, it is constantly falling around the Earth. Why doesn't it come back down? It's because it also is moving very quickly around the Earth so that it actually falls. Instead of falling down, it actually is falling as it falls. It moves fast enough that it continues around the Earth and remains in orbit. But it is essentially in a constant state of free fall, which makes the astronauts appear weightless. And we've already talked a little bit. I wanted to just reemphasize mass and weight. These are two very different concepts. Mass and weight are not the same thing. The mass is the amount of matter contained in an object, whereas the weight is the measure of the force of gravity pulling on an object. So let's look at an example here before we move on to the third law. And our example is looking at the net force. So what is the, the net force uh, exerted on a lawnmower is 51 newtons. If the mass of the lawnmower is 24 kilograms, what is the acceleration? So we have here our image. We're pushing forces going straight to the right in this case. And what rate is the lawnmower going to accelerate if you push with that force? Well, let's go ahead and do as we normally do with our problems. Let's write down what we know. We know the net force is 51 newtons. We know the mass is 24 kilograms. So we're looking at the system here of the lawnmower. So the person is the external force acting upon that lawnmower. Our unknown is the acceleration A. And by Newton's second law, acceleration is equal to net force divided by mass. And if we divide those two and put our numbers in, we find 51 kilograms or 51 newtons divided by 24 kilograms. And in order to check our units, we put 51 kilogram meters per second squared, change the units from newtons. That's just the same as a newton is this section. Then the kilograms will cancel and that will leave us with an acceleration of 2.1 meters per second squared. 
So we can use Newton's second law as an example to calculate the acceleration of the lawnmowers. Now you have to keep pushing with it with that force uh, to keep it accelerating like that. Okay, so let's take a look at Newton's third law of motion. And Newton's third law of motion says whenever a body exerts a force on a second body, the first body experiences a force that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force it exerts. So what it's telling us is forces will occur in pairs. So we look here at the swimmer pushing off and as she pushes off from the wall, the wall pushes off from the feet, the feet push off from the wall, push out on the wall. There are equal and opposite forces. So we have to consider what is our system that we're looking at here. In this case, the system is just the swimmer. So we're not considering the wall as part of the system. And therefore, the force acting on the system is going to be the force with which the wall is pushing back on the feet and causing an acceleration of the swimmer. So that would be the force that we are looking at. The other forces would cancel. So a buoyant force and the weight, the gravitational force would cancel and the acceleration would just be in the left direction. So in that case, where what system it depends on the specific system that we are looking at. So while forces are always equal and opposite, and we can consider this even when you're standing up. So if someone is standing up and they're exerting a force down on the floor and the floor has to be equal, producing an equal and opposite force on the person. And why? Because the person is not accelerating, is not moving in the vertical direction. So if the force were to if the floor were to emit a higher force, then the person would have a net force upward and would start to rise off the floor. If they produced a larger force, if the force of the weight of the person on the floor was larger, then the person would fall through the floor. They'd be pushing on the floor harder than the floor could push back up. So we have to consider again, all forces are equal and opposite, but which ones we're looking at can depend on our system that we're considering. So let's look at an example here that looks at some of these systems. And what we're looking at is the professor pushing a cart and we get her mass of 65 kilograms, the cart's mass of 12 kilograms and the equipment on it of 7 kilograms. And we want to calculate the acceleration produced when the professor exerts a backward force of 150 newtons on the floor. And the opposing forces, including friction, are 24 newtons. So we can draw our free body diagrams and we have two different systems here. We have one large system which includes the professor and the cart and the material and a second system which looks just at the cart and the professor is then producing an external force. So for our first example we're looking at system one and we are going to consider that the external force is the force of the floor pushing forward. So that is our external force and in addition we have the frictional force pushing backward. As typically unless something is moving in the vertical direction those two are going to cancel. So the normal force of the floor pushing upward and the weight of the system which would be the weight of the professor plus the cart plus the equipment would balance and be exactly the same. So we can start off with what we know and let's put those values up there for the forces, the mass of the professor, the mass of the cart and the mass of the equipment. And then we'll have to figure out what we're trying to determine is the acceleration and the equation to use that is acceleration equals the net force divided by the mass. Now the thing is we don't have the net force or the mass quite yet. We have to figure out what those are. So the net force is given by the force of the floor in one direction minus the frictional force pushing backwards. Now we know that the force of the floor was 150 newtons, the frictional force was 24 newtons, and if we subtract those we get the net force of 126 newtons. So that is the amount less what it takes to overcome the friction working against the cart. Now we also need the mass and the mass, the total mass of our system, remember we're looking at system one here. So the system includes the professor, 
the cart and the equipment on the cart. So we have to add those up the 65 kilograms, the 12 kilograms and the seven kilograms to give us a total of 84 kilograms. And now we can put our numbers in. And what we get is 126 newtons divided by 84 kilograms for an acceleration of 1.5 meters per second squared. So that is what we're looking at in this problem. We're looking at the acceleration. Now, if we want to look at another question related to this using the same diagram, but now we're going to look at system two. So in this case, we're considering system two, which excludes the professor and looks only at the cart and the material on it. And we still know the same numbers. We want to calculate the force the professor exerts on the cart. So here we're looking at system two. So we still have our sketch up there. Our numbers haven't changed. The numbers we know are still the same. And now we need to find our net force again that exists and the net force is equal to the force the professor exerts minus the frictional force. And we want to find what we're trying to find is the force that the professor exerts. So we solve this for force of the professor exerts is the net force plus the frictional force. So we're going to need to use that when we know these numbers we can now find what the force the professor exerts if we can find these other two. So let's see what we've got here. We know that the mass in this case now we're looking at system two so the mass is only the cart and the equipment it does not include the professor because she is external to the system that we are looking at. So in this case, the total mass is the mass of the cart and the equipment, which would be 19 kilograms. The net force then is equal to mass times acceleration. Well, we already determined the acceleration previously to be 1.5 meters per second squared. The total mass in this system is 19 kilograms. So the net force is now 29 newtons. And now we can use our previous equation to figure out the force the professor is exerting. And the force the professor is exerting is the net force, which we just determined here, plus the frictional force, which we knew previously, which was 24 newtons given up here. And we add those together to find that the force the professor is exerting is a total of 53 newtons. So you note that the force the professor is exerting is far less than the total force with which the floor was pushing in the previous system. And that's because some of the force of the floor also went to accelerating the professor herself who weighed more than the cart and the equipment together. So that's why the forces are going to be a little bit different. But again, looking at depending on what you're looking at, we have to consider different systems. And we may have to look at just part what looks like part of a system and whether we consider something to be external or internal to the system. Internal forces don't make any difference because they balance out. So in system one, the cart had a force with which it pushed back on the professor and the professor pushed on a cart. Those are then an internal force and they balance and cancel. However, when we look at just system two, now the x the force of the cart on the professor is an external force is an internal is not is an external force and is outside of that system. The force that actually matters is the force the professor is pushing on the cart. So again, and the forces of the foot and the floor, these are all completely external when we're looking at system two. So now that we've looked at an example there, let's go on and look a little bit more about gravity. And in this case, we want to talk about Newton's universal law of gravity. And what we thought here, what was thought, there's Isaac Newton sitting under the apple tree and watching a falling apple and maybe wondering whether that could be related to the orbit of our moon, the orbit of the Earth around the sun or anything else that could the same force that makes that apple fall to the ground keep the moon in orbit around Earth. And that means that you know does the gravity of Earth which pulls the apple down also extend out into space. So every particle in the universe attracts every other particle in the universe with a force along a line joining them. 
So you imagine particle one here, particle two here. This could be the moon. This could be the Earth. And the force is always along a line joining the two. The forces are also equal and opposite. So the Earth pulls on the moon with some force. The moon pulls on the Earth with an equal and opposite force. So forces are always exactly equal. If the forces are equal, why does the moon orbit the Earth and not the other way around? Well, remember Newton's second law. Newton's second law said that the acceleration was inversely proportional to the mass. So the Earth being much more massive has a much smaller acceleration than the moon. So the moon moves a lot more, but actually the Earth does move as well. And they actually orbit around a common center of mass that would just be located uh, much closer to the center of Earth. So we can also formalize the universal law of gravitation here. The, it's given by force equals g times the two product of the two masses of the objects divided by the distance between them squared where g is the gravitational constant given by 6.674 times 10 to the negative 11th and its units are newton meter squared per kilogram squared and we'll see that we need those units when we work calculations with this in order to balance everything out and what we find with such a small constant is that the gravitational force is a relatively weak force. It's very easy to overcome. Now it may seem strong because it's the force that is active over very large distances. However, it is many times weaker than, for example, the electromagnetic force that we will look at in a future chapter. So the electromagnetic force is very uh, can be very strong. And in fact, we see a, ma a magnetic force. If you have a paper clip and a magnet, a small magnet can pick up something and lift it against the gravitational pull of the entire Earth. So gravity is actually a very weak force and is the weakest of the four forces of nature. Now let's look at an example we can calculate with this to figure out the gravitational force between Earth and our moon. So here's the here are the masses given the mass of the Earth in kilograms, the mass of the moon in kilograms, and the radius of the moon's orbit, which would be the distance between the two. So we'll use this as a quick sketch there with our moon here, and r being the distance between them. And we have a large mass for the Earth and a small mass for the moon. And we can put those numbers in. Let's go ahead and write down what we know again. There's keeping track of what we know. Mass of the Earth, the mass of the moon, and the radius of the moon's orbit. What are we trying to find? We're trying to find the gravitational force between them. And we use Newton's law of gravitation, which says uh, this. And then we will put in our numbers so we know all the values to put in there, including the constant g. And we can then calculate what the force is. And we can check that all our units will cancel. So the meters cancel. The kilograms, two kilograms here and two kilograms down here cancel. Two meters here and two meters here. And all that ends up being left is the Newton. And that gives us a force of 1.99 times 10 to the 20th newtons between Earth and our moon. Now, I don't do the calculation here, but I can assure you that if you did that, if the Earth and the moon were one were positively charged and one were negatively charged and you calculated the force between them, it would be many times larger than this force of gravity. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary here. And what we found is, of course, Newton's laws of motion are universal and apply to everything. So they apply to all objects. Weight is measured in the Newton as the unit of measurement, and it is very different than mass. Remember that weight and mass are not equal to each other. Those are very different. And we looked at Newton's universal law of gravitation as a way of describing the force between any two objects with mass in the universe. So every object pulls on every other object. So that concludes this lecture on Newton's laws of motion and gravity. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.